So hello and welcome to another episode of Biographics. I'm your host, Carl Smallwood, and today we're talking about Emperor Titus, the short reign of one of Rome's most popular figures. And I will just note right away, we get comments, a lot of comments, hurtful comments, that people don't like my voice. I'm currently suffering from a cold, so to those people, I'm really, really sorry, but if I don't work, I don't get paid. And speaking of not working and not getting paid, as with all the videos here on Biographics, the script for this one was submitted to us by a member of our writing team. That member of the writing team today being Radu Alexander. You can follow them on the social media links below, alongside my own, where you can check if my name is really Carl Smallwood. It, it is. It, it's rough. I'm in my thirties now, and I've heard every joke there is about it, but if you've got a new one I haven't, let us know in the comments. But, let's get to it. The Flavian Dynasty, a short-lived chapter in the history of ancient Rome, is yet one of great importance that's left an indelible mark on the history of the Empire. It only had three rulers, the father, Vespasian, the two sons, Titus, the topic of today's video, and Domitian. If you've been paying attention to this channel, then you might have already seen our bios covering two of those, which were hosted by our previous and far more aerodynamic host, and probably has a much nicer voice to listen to at this point, Simon Whistler. So if you are interested, you can go check those out after the fact. But we skipped over poor Titus due to his short stint as the Emperor of Rome. Sandwiched between the longer reigns of his father and his brother, Titus ruled for a comparatively short two years before suddenly falling ill and dying. But let's take a look at the things that happened during his short stint as Emperor. The inauguration of the Colosseum, the fire of Rome, albeit not the, the big one, the unparalleled devastation caused by the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. Three pretty major things that are very integral to Roman history and they all happen during Titus's reign. So today we're finishing our Flavian Dynasty trilogy with a look at the life and career of the Roman Emperor Titus, starting as we often like to do at the beginning with the early years. Titus was born in Rome expectedly, on December 30th, 39 AD, the eldest son of the aforementioned Vespasian. He had two siblings, the aforementioned Domitian and a sister called Domitilla, the younger, because his mother was Domitia, the elder. We don't do that anymore, do we? It's like, you know, it'd be like Carl, Carl the second, Carl the third. I want to be Carl the elder. And if I have a son, it'd be Carl the, like, the, the younger. And then if they have a son, it'd be Carl the younger, younger. We don't do that anymore, we should. So far away, Eric, we need to take a break from what was, I'm sure, a incredibly riveting anecdote being told by my past self to talk about today's sponsor, AG1. So yeah, Carl, uh, AG1 sent us both a care package with a bunch of vitamin supplement stuff. We do need to mention that AG1 describes themselves as a daily foundational nutritional supplement that supports whole body health. Well, I got sent this in the mail, which, you know, when that was post my letterbox, I was like, what the hell is this? Because I was expecting all the vitamins. We got our packages mixed up, but they sent me vitamin D and K supplements that you put into your water. And right away, I live in the UK. So vitamin D is, you know, in critically short supply in the winter months. Britain goes through annually at least three bottles of sunscreen per year. So, you know, vitamin D is in critically short supply. And the thing that I'm most excited about is actually getting a decent sized water bottle. Because as someone who goes to the gym and exercises a lot, a water bottle with just a wide brim is so difficult to get and solid plastic. I'm so happy they sent this. This is the thing I was most excited about. Man, you are really passionate about this. Uh, water bottles, yes, always stay hydrated. <laughs> and I'm gonna do it right now. I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna put the drop in, but I always keep putting like accidentally like five drops in, so I'm gonna be so healthy. I swear down, I was at the gym the other day after I'd accidentally like, you know, taken one too many drops. I coughed and three people got better. When I first started taking supplements and vitamins, I was like, is 3,000% of my vitamin C in one go a good idea? It's like, no, 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 because obviously you need to have that much in there because your body processes it so um, uh, slowly. So how's it taste? It tastes fine. It tastes like water. I think it's you who needs to tell us what yours tastes like because you've got like uh, all yeah. the extra stuff. I've just got the one drop in whatever um, uh, drink you happen to be imbibing at that moment. So, Carl, I have not taken vitamins for a while, actually. My job is really sedentary, as you probably know. I spend so much time in my office just editing videos and managing things, so I haven't had a lot of time for exercise either. Since we got this box in the mail, I've actually been taking it, and so far I'm pretty satisfied. Uh, when I first saw this green liquid, I was slightly worried about how it would taste. 
Uh, green is the color of health. Resident Evil taught me this. If it's green, it's healthy. Yes, but I didn't. I was worried it was gonna taste like seaweed or something like that. I don't know. Yeah, I've, I've had the seaweed ones. Yeah. They're not right. Not a fantastic right. mix. I'll be but honest. you know, honestly, I was pleasantly surprised. It tastes like you know the vitamins I used to take as a kid. Probably can't mention what they're really called, but they were based on a cartoon, and they were delicious. You know what I'm talking about. Oh yeah. <laughs> I know which one you mean. We still get yeah. them over here. I like gummy yeah, biting things. Yeah. But I actually mixed the seltzer water with the HE1, and I've got the uh, travel packs, the little uh, 12 grams Pitch one. On screen. Uh, future Eric will be presenting them on camera when he's more presentable. <laughs> I'm, I, this is the end of my work day. I'm going to the gym right after this, so what people see in front of me, I, I've taken my water, that's my hydration, this is my protein shake, which has a shot of coffee, some soy milk, um, water, and um, uh, my whey protein, and then I've got like eight different pills here. That's all my multivitamins, because they sent you the multivitamin mix, and they sent me the vitamin K, so I've got a, I'm still taking my usual supplement routine, which is a lot of pills. When I first started taking the AG1, I was also recovering from a bad stomach bug. Uh, I was told that my gut biome might not be fully recovered for like four months. And that was scary to me because I love breakfast sandwiches. Let me tell you, it is an addiction. Ron Swanson is kind of like my spirit animal. I love breakfast food and bourbon. And you're telling me I'm not going to be able to take those things. Uh, that's terrible. But, you know, a few weeks later, after I started taking the AG1, my gut biome is totally back to normal, and I feel fine. My energy levels are up, too, so I, I feel better overall, and I feel like I now have the energy to work out, I just don't have the time. And during your entire spiel, because my webcam turned off, you didn't see that, I was taking all of my supplements. I'm just reminded of the most disrespectful thing I've ever experienced, Eric. I went on a date. It was a very good day because the next day I woke up and I went into my, my, my kitchen and I was taking my pills. And I remember just the girl, every single one that I took, just went, well done, and clapped. And it was the most disrespectful thing I've ever experienced in my life. So it sounds like the travel packs would be would have a been little very useful, useful for you. It would have saved me a lot of embarrassment in that moment. So thank you to today's sponsor, AG1. Head to drinkag1.com forward slash biographics or click the link in the description to get a one-year supply of immune-supporting AG vitamins, D3 plus K2 plus 5 AG1 travel packs free with your first purchase of AG1. You can't put a price tag on your own health. So we have few decent ancient sources on the life of Titus, but probably the best one we have access to is Suetonius, who was a contemporary and lived through the entire reign of the Flavian dynasty, covering all three emperors in his book, The Life of the Twelve Kaisers. As you will find out, Suetonius was quite a big fan of Titus in particular, whom he described right off the bat as, and I quote, the delight and darling of the human race. So pretty high praise there. Titus's progenitors had been slowly building up the family's prestige by attaining both wealth and status, both very important for being remembered by history. Obviously, this culminated with his father becoming Roman Emperor, but even before then, Vespasian distinguished himself as a skilled military officer during the reign of Claudius. In fact, Vespasian grew close enough to the Emperor that Titus was brought up at Imperial Court as a companion to Claudius' son, Britannicus. More compliments from Suetonius incoming, who described young Titus as, and I quote once again, a handsome person in which there was no less dignity than grace, and he was uncommonly strong, though he was not that tall of stature and had rather a protruding belly. His memory was extraordinary, and an aptitude for almost all of the arts, both of war and of peace. Skillful in arms and both horsemanship, he made speeches and wrote verses in Latin and Greek with ease and readiness, and even offhand. He was besides not unacquainted with music, but sang and played the harp agreeably and skillfully. And there's a couple of details in there that need to be broken down. The first is that it is sometimes suggested that Titus could, as the quote suggests, write in two languages at once, one with his primary hand, one with his offhand, but there's not really any confirmation on that, although there is a historical precedent for people with extraordinary ability for languages being able to do that, but we cannot say for sure. The second is that he was known as being unnaturally strong, which reminds me of one of my favourite lesser known emperors of Rome, Maximinius Thrax, who was, according to legend, eight feet tall and impressed the emperor before he became emperor himself by suplexing a horse. Well, that's neither here nor there. 
and hopefully we can cover Maximinius Thrax in a future video. Let us know in the comments below if you'd like to see that one. But moving back on to the Flavian dynasty, the family's close relationships with the Emperor and his son didn't go anywhere because both Claudius and Britannicus were assassinated to pave the way for Nero. Yes, that Nero. So according to one story, Titus was not only present when Britannicus was killed, but he may have drunk from the same poisoned cup, falling dangerously ill, but he managed to make a full recovery. My old poisonings notwithstanding, the Flavian family was able, for the most part, to stay on Nero's good side, which was a pretty good way to ensure that you survived in the time of Nero. Young Titus continued to rise to the ranks during his reign. He took the standard course for most upper-class Romans with ambitions of climbing the social ladder, first the military, and then politics. During the late 50s AD, he served as a military tribune both in Germany and in Britain. Once he was back in Rome, Titus married twice, but both marriages were fairly short-lived. His first wife died during their first year of marriage, while Titus chose to divorce the second wife after she and her family were implicated in a failed conspiracy against Emperor Nero. And again, just a good bit of advice for any time travellers who go back in time and happen to land in the time of Emperor Nero. If anyone you know or are close to is implicated in anything that would affect Nero, distance yourselves from them as much as possible because Nero wasn't exactly the most emotionally well-adjusted person to have ever led Rome. Which is saying something given all the weirdos who've run Rome, most of which we've probably covered in the past. And I say we, it's like the royal we, biographics is a, a team effort. And I would, I'd be nowhere without the team. Years later, Titus would have a salacious love affair with the Jewish queen Berenike, a member of the Herodian dynasty. However, she was so unpopular with the Romans that Titus decided to just give her the boot when he became emperor himself. He might have intended to bring her back once his position was, you know, more secure, but he died before he got the chance and his paramour disappeared from history records soon thereafter. Rise to the throne. After Titus was done with his military service, he held the office of Quaestor in Rome, but he got called up again in 66 AD when the Great Jewish Revolt erupted in Judea, triggering the First Roman-Jewish War. Emperor Nero tasked Vespasian with putting down the rebellion and wanted his son by his side. This is more Vespasian's story than it was Titus's, so we're not going to harp on it too much since we've already covered it in the past, but suffice to say that the father-son duo were very successful in their efforts, and in 68 AD, the only fortified city of Jerusalem still remained in enemies hands. But then, word reached them that Nero had been assassinated, thus bringing an end to the Julio-Claudian dynasty. The throne was up for grabs, and immediately Vespasian's troops boldly hailed him as the new emperor. He graciously accepted, as one would do. Unsurprisingly, he was not the only guy vying for the position, though. This triggered a civil war in 69 AD, known awesomely as the Year of the Four Emperors, which, again, has more to do with Vespasian than Titus, so if you want a more detailed look at it, you can go check out the bio we did for him a couple of years ago. And the short version is, is that four guys fought for the job, and ultimately Vespasian won. While the father was busy dealing with like all that emperor stuff over in Rome, Titus stayed behind in Judea to finish the war they'd started. He laid siege to Jerusalem on 70 AD, but all he had to do really was just wait. With no reinforcements on the horizon, things could only end in one of two ways. Surrender, or the people inside would starve to death. Not to mention that Titus was aided by the fact that the Jewish resistance was fighting amongst itself, splintering into several factions who were all fighting with one another, overall weakening their defence. After almost five months of siege, the Roman forces overwhelmed the remaining defenders and penetrated the heart of Jerusalem. They set the city on fire and destroyed the hallowed Second Temple, which has stood as a central pillar of the Jewish faith for almost 500 years, something noted by historians as being a real dick move. Once the war was won, Titus took the scenic route back to Rome, stopping at several cities where he received various honours and titles, and by doing this, Titus aroused some suspicion that he may have been gunning for the throne himself, and that he intended to challenge his father's rule. This couldn't have been further from the truth, Titus was very happy that his father had become emperor, and once he realised the meaning of his actions, or at least the people's interpretation of them, he dismissed his army and rushed home to show his devotion to the new emperor. Emperor Daddy. Vespasian returned admiration in full and from the very beginning was very clearly grooming Titus as his heir. The two of them celebrated a triumph together to commemorate their victory in the war and after that Titus was made a censor, then tribune, then consul seven times alongside Vespasian plus an eighth consulship with his brother. For his father's ten-year reign Titus, and I quote, never ceased to act as the emperor's partner and even his protector. 
He strayed in tyrannical territory once he assumed command of the Praetorian Guard, putting to death anyone even slightly suspected of plotting against his father. Clearly, he was completely loyal to his dad, and the two of them usually saw eye to eye when it comes to running the Empire. There is, however, one little conflict worth telling when Titus protested his father's idea of placing a tax on public urinals. In response, Vespasian is said to have picked up some gold coins obtained from this very tax and said, See my son if they have any smell which is a pretty baller thing to do with pea money. So on June 23rd, 79 AD, Vespasian died from an illness. According to Cassius Dio, there was an attempt to incriminate Titus as possibly having poisoned his father, but the gamble failed and Titus was crowned the new emperor of Rome. Emperor, at least for a little while. Although Titus went a little, shall we say, murder crazy when he was with the Praetorian Guard, he was quite the opposite when he was Emperor himself. He committed no acts of wanton murder during his reign, or even put anyone to death under circumstances that would have been considered to be entirely justifiable. He even forgave people who were accused of plotting against him. Titus refused to hear cases based on the charge of what was known then as the Law of Treason, which included things like libel and slander against the Emperor. Oftentimes, the charge was followed by a swift beheading plus confiscation of the property, and was a pretty convenient way for Emperors to get rid of people they didn't like and consolidate their own power. Instead, Titus declared, and I quote, it is impossible for me to be insulted or abused in any way, for I do naught that deserves censure, and I care not for what is reported falsely. What a don. Moving on, the president of his fan club, Suetonius, described Emperor Titus as, and I quote one more time, most kindly by nature. He took away nothing from any citizen. He respected others' property, if anyone ever did. In fact, he would not accept even proper and customary presents, and yet he was second to none of his predecessors in munificence. It's basically just just very magnanimous and humble, for an emperor at least. Despite his seemingly benevolent nature, Titus did face multiple challenges during his admittedly short reign. Just a few months after his ascension to the throne, Mount Vesuvius erupted, killing thousands of people and completely obliterating the cities of Pompeii and Herculaneum. In response, Titus appointed two ex-consuls to oversee the relief efforts and use the properties of the people who perished and had no living heirs to shelter those left homeless. He is said to have made two visits to Pompeii during his reign, one for every year he was alive. During the second visit, a giant fire broke out in Rome that burned down large sections of the city. Or they should not be confused with the Great Fire of Rome in 64 AD, which is the one where Nero supposedly fiddled while Rome burned, which is not true, so don't bug us about it in the comments. Moving back to Titus and his visits to Pompeii, on both occasions he donated large sums of money from his own personal piggy bank to help the people affected by the disasters. And if you want an in-depth look at Vesuvius' eruption or Herculaneum, we have one ready to go on our sister channel, Geographics. Yeah, I'm also the host over there. And also we've got a new host over there now, it's Eric, who uh, works behind the scenes as one of the editors, occasionally writing articles, and uh, the person who is my point of contact for everything behind the scenes. So, hi Eric! Hey Carl! Okay, so we've had an eruption and a fire. How about a little plague as well? Because we didn't even mention that in the intro. Apparently a plague broke out around the same time as the fire, because why not? And we don't know much about this plague, just a few quick mentions from our boy Suetonius, but he did specify that there was no aid, human or divine, which Titus did not employ, searching for every kind of sacrifice and all kinds of medicine in an attempt to stem the flow. To me, if I was like a really deeply religious Roman emperor, and I've been on the throne for like four months and already had a plague, the earth itself had exploded, and then the city I ruled caught fire the moment I left it, I'd see that as some kind of sign. I don't know what the science trying to say, but it's definitely saying something. It wasn't all just doom and gloom under Titus. There were some good parts too. For example, Titus inaugurated the Colosseum, Rome's most iconic landmark, which I've been to. It's very awe-inspiring. You're not allowed to see most of it because it's still under construction. No, reconstruction because they're trying to make sure it doesn't fall down. And the friend that I went with, me and him decided to do some pull-ups on some scaffolding for Russell Crowe. So Titus didn't oversee the entire construction of the Colosseum. His father had started construction of the amphitheatre, but it was completed in 80 AD under Titus. And for the grand opening, the emperor lavished the people of Rome with all manner of games, gladiatorial fights, and shows that lasted for 100 straight days. And of all the remarkable, spectacular things that occurred in that 100 days, Cassius Dio saw fit to highlight one particular unusual sight. That was a battle between some cranes, the bird, and four elephants. And it's really unclear what that means and whether it is a battle between some cranes and some other things, or just some cranes fighting amongst themselves, I suppose, and then later a fight with some elephants, or if he meant an actual fight between some cranes, the bird, and four elephants, 
because that one really seems like it'd be very one-sided, a, a curb stomp symphony, if you will, but we don't know, and it's really difficult to imagine, but a lot of stuff like that happened in the arena, so yeah, and Cassius Dio saw fit to recall it, so it must have been pretty impressive. So once the games were concluded, Titus travelled to Sabine territory, but suddenly fell ill on the way back. He took refuge in the very same farmhouse his father passed away in all those years ago, and that is where he died on September 13th, 81 AD, aged 41. Rumours swirled that his brother Domitian might have had something to do with his death, and that it wouldn't have been the first time that he plotted against Titus, but we can't say anything definitive. So I hope everybody at home found this video to be entertaining, informative, and educational. I certainly found the script to be all three of those things and if you are inclined to agree you can let the author Radu Alexander know at the social media links found below. I've been your interim host Carl Smallwood, I also host over our sister channels Top Tens and Geographics though my hosting duties on Geographics are now shared with uh, Eric, what's the one? Oh. so I want to say his pen name, I know his real name I don't want to say his pen name, <laughs> what is it again? Let's have a look, so I want to say like Malachite but it's not that. Wait what? Malachite, there we go, why am I saying Malachite? Is that the, that's the villain of like Thor too, right? But either way, he's taking over hosting duties on Geo sometimes for the ones that I'm uncomfortable or unable to do because of, I fall ill all the time because I'm a pale, pasty British man. But I, I guess I'll end with asking people to like if they like the video, comment with any feedback or suggestions, and subscribe for more content like this. And just as a final bonus fact about the Colosseum, because I've written extensively about it in the past, the Colosseum is one of the few points of historical record we have for a very, very heated debate online. That being, what would happen if a lion fought a tiger? And if people are blissfully unaware of what I'm talking about here, there has been a long-standing debate, it's literally, I think it's centuries old at this point, but it's really prevalent online, as it would be, because people online will argue about anything, and that is, could a lion beat a tiger and vice versa? And there's an idea of how intense this debate can get. The Wikipedia page for tigers is one of the singular most edited and controversial pages on the site, because of a single line someone added, which read something to the effect of, tigers are considered to be the most powerful big cat which led to a literal 10,000 word argument between Wikipedians about what that meant, which culminated in fans of lions accusing the people editing the tiger page to be positive about the tiger of being tiger fanboys. And for anyone curious about what would happen if a lion fought a tiger, they don't interact in the wild, they occasionally sometimes um, uh, like uh, meet each other in zoos and like come to blows, like claws, I suppose. But the Roman Colosseum is one of the few places where lions and tigers will be directly pitted against one another, and every single time the tiger would win. I'm probably you know waffling a little bit, but I did make an entire video about this for my channel, Fact Fiend with Cal Smallwood, which you can find by just googling um, Fact Fiend Lions and Tigers. Cheers everybody, and go out there and have the day that you deserve.